What I'm going to talk about today in the industrial chemical space with the passage of the Lautenberg Act is first I'm going to spend about half an hour going over some of the key changes that the law brought to us, and they are significant. So now we have a mandatory duty to prioritize and assess those chemicals for safety. And we have to do that against a risk-based standard. If the EPA does identify an unreasonable risk associated with its evaluation of an existing chemical substance, it must then move directly to regulatory action to address those risks. And that's where cost-benefit balancing, impact on the economy, substitutes, et cetera, come into play. Finally, um, for this slide, an expanded authority to acquire exist, uh, information on chemicals. The first thing we have to do is uh, do a prioritization exercise to take those existing substances, those thousands, however many there are, and I'll get to that in, in a minute, um, and come up with a process for prioritizing them to identify which substances might be high and low for risk evaluation. If we identify a chemical as a high priority for risk evaluation, we must move directly then to conduct that risk evaluation. We have three years to do it. Um, one starting point is to um, fulfill another provision of the law, which is to identify an active inventory of chemical substances. So whatever that number is of active substances, that becomes the universe Upon, uh, on which we'll do this prioritization exercise to identify those chemicals that will be candidates for, uh, for risk evaluation. A risk evaluation means more than just an assessment of the risk. It also means a determination about whether that um, a chemical presents an unreasonable risk for the conditions of use of that chemical. Now the law requires us to do evaluations on the conditions of use, and generally speaking, um, we believe that that means most, if not all, of the uh, identifiable uses of that chemical substance. Within three and a half years, we have to be up to doing 20 substances a year for risk evaluation. And as we complete one, another one needs to come into the program through that prioritization process that I mentioned. All of these uh, issues related to conditions of use, unreasonable risk, um, reasonably available information to conduct a risk evaluation. There's a lot of discussion going on on what those terms mean and how they would affect an evaluation of an existing chemical. Um, a lot of this is going to play out in the doing, obviously, and these first 10, I think, will be our proving ground as to how we, uh, how we work with those concepts articulated in the law. How we work reasonableness um, into the evaluation to make the determination based solely on the assessment and risk-based criteria um, is something that um, we're all going to have to work through. Certainly, um, we have um, benchmarks that uh, we've used for decades for risk, um, cancer and non-cancer. Um, so we'll have to uh, work these out through the, uh, through the first 10. But if in those first 10 should we identify risks of concern, then we'll have to move right to risk management and, and those cost factors will begin to come into play in, in how we address um, those risks. And we'll have two years to do risk management action after having identified those risks in the evaluation. The work plan isn't the only place that is a source of chemicals for risk evaluation. Chemical manufacturers can request um, a risk evaluation of, of a chemical as well. Um, if that chemical is one of the work plan chemicals, then the law says that the manufacturer should pay half of the cost of the risk evaluation. If it's not on the work plan, they pay the full cost. For new chemicals, um, the uh, changes were uh, equally profound in that now for a new chemical substance during our uh, pre-manufacture review, we must make an affirmative determination as to whether that chemical substance presents an unreasonable risk. I've outlined here where essentially uh, four 
uh, considerations that or determinations that the agency might make um, for a new substance during that 90-day uh, review that we have for pre-manufacture notices. Um, the first is the will present. We, if we have information that suggests, suggests that the chemical substance will uh, uh, present an unreasonable risk, we would move right to a, a, an order under 5F of the statute to, to address it. That's actually something that, that's, um, that's not new. What is new is the second bullet here, where it says, in, if, we have inform, if information is insufficient to make a finding, a do a reasoned evaluation of the, uh, of the risk of the substance, we would then issue an order under Section 5E to, uh, to basically state that if the com a company wants to uh, commercialize this substance, then we're going to need additional information prior to um, commercialization. Make a finding of uh, may present unreasonable risk. Um, we made this uh, uh, previously. What's changed, though, now is that under the new law, we would make a determination um, for known and reasonably foreseen uses. Uh, and what that means to us, as we're interpreting the law now, is that the known uses are what are in the pre-manufactured pre notice. A company says, we intend to commercialize this substance for these uses. Those to us are the known uses. The reasonably foreseen uses, um, as we're interpreting that now, is if there are um, uses associated with a close analog to this chemical, a chemical that seems to be one that's closely related and could likely um, be used in the same way as the PMN substance, and there are uses there that are not on the PMN form, then we would have to make our determination not only on the uses that are in the PMN form, but also on those reasonably foreseen uses. And finally, there's the finding of not likely to present unreasonable risk. Um, not finding, not likely, um, doesn't say safe, but um, it's with the, the language it was in the law. And basically for us, that means if a substance is not likely to present, then um, the company uh, is uh, good to go to manufacture per the, per the PMN form with, with uh, no restrictions. Making that affirmative finding is a big change. Um, the law now requires that um, companies substantiate their uh, CBI claims. The law uh, allows us to uh, partially offset the costs of implementing the law um, with a fees provision to up to uh, uh, 25 million uh, in annual user fees to support the program. There was a special provision in the law for persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. I mean, and it was very specific. It said, look at the existing TOSCA work plan identify those chemicals that um, ranked high for persistence and bioaccumulation and, and, and toxicity, um, set aside the metals, set aside those chemicals where you've take, you're taking other action under other um, sections of the law, like section five, um, set aside those for which you've already started problem formulation. Well, that, uh, that uh, left us with seven chemical substances. Basically, the, uh, the law implied that uh, given that they were PBTs, essentially the, the risk case had, had been made and it was really uh, uh, incumbent on the agency to take exposure reduction actions against them. The law did say, though, that EPA, you've got to stick to your time frames as mandated by the law and you can't pause the state forever. So um, should we not meet our deadline, then that state pause is, is lifted. Thank you.